everybody. Uh, hope everybody is doing well. I hope that you've had a great week to this point. Uh, I really truly hope that in some way, shape, form, or fashion that you are taking you and those you love and care about in the right direction and on an extended way and level and uh, pace reaching out beyond yourself to touch someone in the community. Uh, it is so important that we reclaim community mindset. It's so important that we reclaim uh, the village concept. It's so important that we start to see the beauty in one another at a level that we connect. When we don't connect, we are easily divided, easily misled, easily um, manipulated, and we're seeing it so uh frequently and so pervasively now so uh that's my hope look here we are this is another segment of the black voice this is uh none other than uh dr rick wallace look check this out if you like what you see or hear on this channel this video and any others click the like button uh if it's something that you think you want to stay connected with hit the subscribe button, share it with those people you think that it may influence, empower, impact, encourage, inspire, and the like. If you have followed me and you are familiar with this page and the work we do, or if something within this video resonates with you and you want to continue to see the work we do in the community, show some support by looking in the description box and donating to the organization's work which includes a research center a think tank uh programs implemented within the community everything from black man lead to programs for domestic violence intimate partner violence uh childhood sexual abuse child uh adverse childhood experiences and more uh we are full throttle ahead we are still committed to being a difference maker but it does require support with that being said look i want to talk to you about the game um, i've been doing everything i can to present to you the things that i've discovered over the 30 plus years of my studying and research whether it's been historical research whether it's been uh looking in and riding the waves of those who came before me in the areas of finance and economics or whether it's in the area where i hang my hat in human behavior psychology and sociology where i've logged countless a number of thousands upon thousands of hours in research to produce to you and give to you solutions not just any i'm not if you notice i'm not a debater I'm not on people's thing trying to debate. I'm not here to have intellectual pissing contests. I'm not here to try to prove how smart I am. I, I'm here to say, hey, look, this is what I found. This is what my suggestions are with dealing with it. I've given you the blueprint for black empowerment, a literal comprehensive, um, uh, comprehensive agenda and strategy for literally rescuing the black community and the black race in the United States. Um, it is a massive work it took me a while uh but but it's there and it's not there to sit back and gloss and you know and gloat over it's there for other great minds to come look at and say well what about this that's what i wanted to happen when i created it but look we've got work to do one of the things that i've consistently said is black people as a collective are where we are at because we don't understand how things work and I have given you uh, example after example after example, real live situations where we are getting exploited and played because we don't understand the game. We haven't taken time to learn how the game is played on an economic level. We haven't learned military science to encapsulate and insulate ourselves from outside influences and infiltration. We haven't learned the political game on a geo uh, political scale or a geographic political scale and it shows in the outcomes it shows in the racial wealth gap it shows in the disproportionality of special education referrals for young black males versus any other race or uh, gender and i can go on and on of all the different things that i presented to you about the identity crisis uh, about all the games that are being played now we have this situation where uh kamala harris uh sat down with uh quavo uh, and talked about uh, the need for gun violence and uh, basically 
I'm gonna call a spade a spade and anybody who has followed me knows how I feel about Kamala Harris who exploits um, her father's uh, uh, genetic background which is partially Irish and I believe Jamaican um, her mom is 100% Eastern Indian and that's what she's always identified when she was sworn in as a senator she was sworn in as the first Indian American senator not African American it wasn't until she ran for uh, with Biden for president or when she was actually running in the primary and competing um, for a chance to run for president that she started talking about African American and all of this and her record in California as a uh, district attorney in San Francisco San Francisco and as the state's attorney general is horrific when it comes to young black males so we need to be aware of that but which makes this even more ironic uh, but what she did is she used the notoriety of the death of takeoff uh, which is Quavo's nephew and uh, one third of the Migos. She used his death, hit the notoriety around his death, and used it. You know, elections coming up, midterms. Is it is it mid? Yeah, or is no? We're getting ready for presidential election. Is, or is it midterms? Shows where, where my where, where I'm concerned with that. But what happens is she is using this as a platform to pander black votes. I care about young black men dying. No, you're using the notoriety, notoriety of a very famous person. You're using the pain of his family who is advocating for changes, not just in gun legislature, which I actually commend uh, Quavo for and anybody else that's on his advisory committee uh, because he's also pushing for a bill that's uh, been written that will treat gun violence and uh, like an epidemic the same way we treat drug uh, use and, and other things and so then we approach it from a different perspective which then leans into the things that I've been talking about there's prevention in that and so I don't know who's in his ear but I, I'm, I'm happy that they are and again my issue isn't with him or his family he his mom and his sister who happens to be the mother of takeoff uh, were there and they had this conversation and again I, 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 I personally find it uh, immensely disingenuous of Kamala Harris to present herself as someone who's actually concerned about what's going on with black men because see here's what I know from the work I do in the community that while Takeoff's death though uh, Takeoff's death is, was violent and tragic it was a microcosm of a much larger issue that is highly prevalent and has been consistently present in the United States for decades. Young black men are dying at the hands of young black men. And the only time we hear about it is when there's a way to demean and uh, discredit somewhat the push in the, in the demands of blacks for white cops to stop killing black men. We get black on black crime as the argument. Well, you killing each other, but nobody has really truly talked about addressing this issue outside of the black community. I've been talking about it for multiple decades. I've done research on it. I told you what needs to be done to reduce the proclivity of violence among young black males. Number one, you've got to address the poverty issue. Poverty comes with crime and violence. It just simply does, regardless of race. But when it comes to young black men, uh, we have to worry about socialization, a, a, an identity crisis, a need and an understanding of knowing who we are. We need to replace the 1.5 million black men that are missing in our community. Hell, 1.3 of them are in prison. A lot of them because of warped and sideways and disproportionately applied laws created by uh, Joe Biden in the crime bill of 1994 that gave more time for crack cocaine than it did powder cocaine that decimated black communities instead of providing support and help for an epidemic that was ravaging the community and then turns around now and is pumping uh, 
countless amount of funds into programs for uh, opioid addiction, which is pre predominantly uh, impacting what whites. Uh, and we can see why we didn't want to really go after people with powder cocaine because Junior over there cutting up. Uh, but back to this thing with Kamala Harris. Again, I commend Quavo uh, for allowing his pain, and he was present when it happened. By the way, it happened here in Houston, and when I tell you the streets rumbled, it, that man, the, there was so much happening on the streets of Houston when this happened that I don't know how much of it got beyond uh, though the, the, the ears that hear, so to speak. But it was a lot of things going on that reverberated. And my thing is, I get it. I understand he's he, he, he's well known. Uh, he's connected. A lot of people, you know, uh, want to stand up for him. You know how we are about celebrities. Here's my problem, though. Whether it be Houston, whether it be Wilmington, Delaware, I have a kid that I've worked with before whose mom I became very good friends with. Um, when you hear me talk about, matter of fact, when you hear me talk about me going to war uh, with the Charlotte Mecklenburg um, uh, school district, independent school district, it was behind this young man and how they were treating him. And he's, you know, he's had his issues, but he's a good kid, uh, just struggling to try to find himself again. We need more programs. So he left. Uh, Charlotte because some things went on in Charlotte and he went back to his mom's hometown of Wilmington uh, which at one point was the Myrtle capital of the US per capita it, it's it's like crazy they had come to me several times uh, 2011 2012 2013 up in that area trying to get something done there but it's so much chaos on so many different levels anyway that young man got shot last Friday Fortunately, he survived. If you remember, this summer, my new neighbor just moved in. Within three weeks, he gets shot. My truck gets shot up, and I almost get shot trying to go out there and break it up. And I don't live in the hood. But it's seeping out of the hood. Now, this is common. Where I, I, I'm constantly hearing about death. If it's not that, then somebody's shooting somebody. I'm down at the juvenile, I'm, and I say juvenile, do you listen to what I'm saying? I'm down at the juvenile justice center advocating for young black men because of not only doing delinquent stuff, but stuff like violence, shooting. You say, well, why are you advocating for some kid who shot someone? Because he's a kid. And because at some point he was a little kid and at some point somebody failed him. And, at, and my thing is, at this point, he hasn't killed anybody yet. At this point, he's still salvageable. And even those who have done violent crimes, if they can change and turn around, I want to work with them. We throw our people away. And let me get back because that's on a whole nother thing. What I'm trying to get you to understand is Kamala all of a sudden cares about what's happening with violence in the streets of black America. Give me a freaking break. No, you don't. What you care about is playing on the emotions of black people because a lot of people still remember what it was to see that video and see that kid dying on that floor uh, in what looks like a mall or some kind of place like that. Uh, and my thing is you're capitalizing on the blood of a black man for votes. You're pandering to black people under the assumption or postulation that we are not sophisticated enough in our thinking and our critiquing and our critical analysis to see what you're doing and that we're going to fall for the old 60 year okie doke of the Democrats have our backs. No, nah, lady. Uh, no, nah. no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Um, and, 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 and for those of you who don't know me, this is no cape for the Republicans. I don't have uh, a loyalty to a party. I'm looking at some I'm looking at people and what they do individually. How did you vote? 
And that's the problem. We don't even know how most of these people are voting. We hear a bill passed or it didn't pass. And we go, we don't see if our guy voted on our interest. Because even if it didn't pass, if our guy that we elected voted on our interest, then we have to say that they are voting and we need to get behind them and see what we can do to help them. But when we are not even keeping up with who is voting what and who is doing what and who's lobbying what under the under the radar that may be working against us, we don't pay attention to politics at a level to participate in it. So we're easy, we're easy pickings for because all they do is come in and say they're racist. Do you realize that Biden basically ran in the black community on the fact that he wasn't Trump? And what gets me is the vast majority of blacks are, are of the Abrahamic faith, meaning that we're either Christians or we practice Islam. So in this instance, either way, whether we're talking the Bible or the Quran, tell me at what point in anywhere in there that you're ever told to choose the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. Not what you're going to be exposed to, not what you may have to deal with, not things that are inevitable, what you choose. You got to understand your vote is an endorsement. Your vote says, I believe in you. Your vote. And that's another thing. We have this 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 thing we love to guilt one another with when it comes to voting. You need to vote. Our ancestors died for the vote. Actually, not a whole lot of people died for the vote. Really, that's not what we would. We there was a lot more going on. The truth of the matter is, the Thirteenth Amendment gave us vote, gave us the right to vote. What was happening in the South is they had came up with policies and things that were circumventing what we already had the right for. So that had to be reestablished, and that was some people that were marching and some things going on. Um, and so, yeah, so let's just say after the Voters Voting Rights Act that, that, that leveled everything out and said we're going to do that. And there's always still something going on. That's just the game played. And it's played on both sides. You just don't know it. You just hear the side that you want to hear. But both sides are playing us both ends to the middle. And what, what I tell people all the time, the right wing and the left wing belong to the same bird. So then that bird has been shitting on the head of black people from day one. We never had a, 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 an advocate in the fight, not, not on any real true level. We've been played, we've been used as pawns, we've been used as strategic pieces, but we have never had someone actually advocating for us. If we had someone truly advocating and there was any true grit and, and traction to this adv advocacy, then what we would see is we wouldn't be the only, Greek, uh, only group only racial enclave, only ethnic group or religious group that had been mishandled and maligned and traumatized that has not received any form of reparations. But while we are being told we, they, they don't have the money, while we are being told that, 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 um, let me see. Uh, and uh, let me get back to where I. Oh my God. All right, here we go. Got a lot going on. Sorry about that, y'all. Uh, but we are sitting here, and this guy is telling us there's no money. We 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 got to do a study, and even some of our own that look like us that are up there are sitting up talking about we need uh, to do a study on it. So they set up a, a council uh, to do a study on what, what, what needs to be done. And if, if blacks, no, you don't need no, you didn't need a study to play the Chippewas. You didn't need a study to pay uh, the, the Japanese uh, that were in internment camps. You didn't need, uh, I mean, just constantly after group after group after group get, getting taken care of. And we keep getting told, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe next year, maybe this time, we're going to get you. And, and, and you keep running back and you keep voting for them. And they keep running the same game. While B Biden just met with the president in Ukraine and gave them another $34 billion. Now, this is the same government that had to come up with some kind of special, uh, uh, special plan just to keep the government open. The same government that's telling us they don't have money to take care of us, but they, they, they're pumping billions 
over in the Ukraine. But if you understood what was really going on in the Ukraine, you would understand why. But that's for another discussion. So here, here, here's the thing now. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I, I want to talk real briefly about the whole Dion Jimmy Horn thing, what I talked about the other day. But I want to, I want to finish this thing on Kamala Harris. If you really truly cared about what happened with black men, you know you have access to the same studies, the same uh, research, the same information that I have access to, the same stuff that I've published. You have access to that. You know what you can get behind. You know what you can do. You show up for photo ops. I've been talking to you about childhood. I've been talking to everyone. I've been sharing with you. Childhood adverse uh, adverse childhood experiences. Epigenetic influence on overall health outcomes. Epigenetic influence on uh, traumatic experiences in um, implicit memory or traumatic memory. I've been talking to you about the disproportionality of special education referrals of young black men. I've been talking to you about the need to racially socialize young black, young black males to reduce the proclivity of violence, to reduce the dropout rate, which would, induce, which would reduce the incarceration rate, which would also increase their proclivity to develop skills that will allow them to earn a uh, livable uh, wage. And I can go on and on. So it's out there. So then it's not about how you deal with it. You don't stop violence by saying you're going to pass gun laws. Laws, first and foremost, are for people who obey laws. If I'm, if I'm hell-bent on breaking a law, getting a gun is one of the easiest things in the world to do, and putting out a law is not going to stop it. I did, Dr. Blanchard and I did a study on school shootings, predominantly don't affect blacks, mass shootings anyway. Now you have these altercations at school where people uh, get harmed or shot, but mass shootings don't predominantly affect blacks, but that's where millions and billions are actually being pumped into inner city schools where our children are being policed. We're literally having a military presence in our communities via our schools so our children are learning in environments that look like prisons feel like prisons and handle like prisoners and we're wondering why we're producing such violence see there's answers to this stuff that they talked about in this interview that got you know that got published and put out there again this has absolutely nothing to do with what Quavo's trying to do he's trying to get whatever platform he can pushed uh, to make a difference He's taking his pain and doing something. He's doing what people should do when you lose somebody in a way like that. You take that energy, you take that love and that pain you're feeling and you turn it into something positive. You give their name a legacy uh, because they want to write the legacy of this kid by way of the way he died. And if you actually look at it from what I gather, I have never actually been a fan of the Migos, but it really drove me to look into them. And while I have my issues with this generation, it seems a lot of that stuff was positive, fun type stuff, positive stuff. I didn't see a lot of violence. I could be wrong. And if it, it does exist, it needs to be dealt with. I don't I don't agree with it because that's how they're programming our children. Uh, again, something else that I've talked about, the use of propaganda, especially through the music industry, to program our children um for fallacious and erroneous behavior, something that we definitely actually need to sit down and work with. So again, here we go. This is what I want you guys to do. I want you to really actually stop and think. When have we had an advocate? Not somebody in our ear telling us, hey, I got you, they racist, we not, uh, we're going to throw this out here, we're going to do it. Tell me, based off of what you can track. See, I can track home ownership. I can track disproportionality in education. I can track mass incarceration. I can track the racial gap. I can track all of the different things that are going on. And I can look up and see where we were in 1960. And I can see where we are now. And I can sit up and say we haven't gained any ground, regardless of whether it was a Republican or a Democrat in office. And I can also tell you that during 1965 up until Johnson left office was a time that we took the biggest hits in policy towards the black community. The disruption of the black community through, through social, social programming. Uh, and this was after they knew because uh, Daniel Patrick Monaghan 
uh, had actually submitted a, 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 a an essay, a, a research paper, uh, known as the Monahan Report. It was it was uh, actually entitled "The Negro Family: A Case for National Action," and he submitted it, and it, it specifically uh, derided trying to create social programs and said, take that same money that you were going to use in social programs, create jobs, give black men jobs, because at that time, black men was were the, and still are, the most unemployed and underemployed. So even when they were employed, they were underpaid uh, in, in the country. Give them meaningful work with meaningful pay and let them take care of their families. And it was ignored. It was tossed to the side. He was derided. Matter of fact, he was treated so horribly in his push for it. He literally flipped and just went into politics and actually became elected. He was an advisor to Johnson. He was in the social. Uh, I forgot what what party he actually worked in, but he he initially got into it and you know just kind of faded to black after a while. But hey, look, ask yourself, do that. Tell me what they've done. You've got to have this. And back to what I was saying about the vote. People get mad at me and they try to uh, guilt others into voting because so-and-so died for it. people, our people. And then, so then that means your vote is very important. I, I, I agree. If somebody died for something, for me to have something, then what that thing that, they, that I have because they died for it is important. Here's the problem. The vote is the only place that I can think of where something of value is given away for nothing. Something that people claim to be so freaking valuable, they give it away for nothing. Just for the sake of saying I gave it away. That's not how you use it. There's actually political strategy in withholding the vote. See, the vote isn't simply about who's going to win because we only make up 14% of the population. It's not about who's going to win. It's about who still believes in the system. People who don't believe in the system don't participate in it. So when voter turnout drops to a certain level, they become aware of the fact that something's not right and some things need to change. But if everybody's turning out and just throwing their vote at who they hate the least, the lesser of two evils. Again, I ask you, where at in your Abrahamic faith, whether it's Christianity or Islam, does it ever say that you can have the lesser of two evils? That your choice is, well, this isn't as bad as that one. Or are you supposed to be choosing what's right, what's best? I don't, I don't want poison. I don't care which one is the worst poison. I don't want poison. I'm not going to choose poison. No matter what, I'd rather not get anything than to get poison. And we've been sucking down poison like crazy, and it's eking out of the pores of our children. It's eking out of the pores of the performance in our communities. It's eking out of the pores of black men who are turning on our women. It's eking out of the pores of black women who literally act like they hate black men and constantly deride and talk about us as if we are unneeded. It's eking out of the pores of children who are tired of trying to come up in a world where daddy's not present or mom and daddy are at odds because we've devalued the family following the flow. Kamala, I see you. That's, you know, that's vice president. That is Kamala. It's Joe Biden and Kamala. If we, we going to call Trump, Trump, we going to call Biden, Biden, and we just going to keep it moving. Because honestly, nobody that's sitting at old, over awful has held us down. The one that might have, depending on what you believe to be true or not they killed him but he wasn't just talking about us he was exposing everything they, they killed him then turned around and killed his brother and probably gonna get his nephew because because he owned one and i don't blame him speak the truth stand on your truth catch a square and go down
That's how I'm doing. I'm going down, catching my. I'm not. I'm not gonna play. You know how many times I could have sold out my people, and be set. I'm articulate. I'm intelligent. I'm an exceptional writer. All the things I've been recruited on. How many times offered things that'll get me way more than the stuff that I have to deal with, it's fighting for my people. I gotta live with that. I'd rather fight from where I'm at, for what I believe in, and die with my character intact than to sell my people out and live a life of luxury and can't even look at myself in the mirror. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not the only one. This world right now is, when we talk about the black community, is literally a makeup of what we used to refer to as the talented 10th which are supposed to be the leaders the ones who pull our people up the ones who feed our people knowledge encourage our people prepare our people empower our people we are the ones and they've always known that so they've always looked for ways to extract the talented 10th put them on a pedestal elevate them and then point back down and say, tell those who are left behind, they did it, why can't you? And then encourage them to sit down and marginalize and look at those that are left behind as if something's wrong with them. And I refused to play that game. And, but, and there are others, but that's what it's made up. It's made up of those who are going to get on that stage and make it seem like if you want to do this, you can do this and you can be pro. No, you can do it. But you're going to be serving the interest of someone that doesn't have the interest of your people at heart. And then when they get tired of you, when they get through with you, they're going to do what they always do. They're going to destroy you. The reason they're not just going to not deal with you anymore is because they need to destroy you to in destroy your credibility. So that if you are ever able to come back and tell where the bodies are buried, nobody's going to believe you. You're just bitter because this happened. You're just bitter because you got caught doing this. And everybody's got their damn hand in the cookie jar. So they get you to put your hand in the cookie jar so they have you. Then they give you what they want until they don't need you anymore. I've watched it over and over and over again. I know this isn't the normal, hey, Dr. Rick's quoting stats, Dr. Rick's talking science, Dr. Rick. I've done them nothing that. I've written, I've written thousands of pages. I've literally looked back, I've written over a million, two million freaking words. I mean, it's there. Go get it. What I want to talk to you about is what I observe that you can go observe. You don't need a degree to do it. You, don't, you just need to be willing to think outside of the biases of your past experiences and the biases of what your parents did and the biases of what propaganda is being pushed upon you and say, I'm going to see a fact for a fact. And then when you see the fact for the fact, you're going to look up and you're going to say, oh, wow, you've been playing me. This has happened. That's happened. That's happened. That's happened. That's happened. When you've got that much happening and it's all against you, you got to sit up and say, what's going on? I got to be the most unluckily. Uh, un we've got to be the most unlucky group of people or something's going on. And I'm going to just tell you something's going on. OK, so then what do we do about it? Stop buying into the bull crap. Start taking action. Start doing the things we're supposed to be doing and stop waiting on them to do something they're never going to do because it doesn't benefit them. Malcolm told you, stop waiting on people who you are literally, don't stop waiting on your enemy to educate your children to compete against theirs. He told you, only a fool does that. We talk about over and over again, the things we're expecting, they are never going to empower you to outperform them, to out-earn them, to disempower them. You're seen as a massive threat. That's why you get so much focus. That's why so much vitriol. Then I'm going to move uh, into this thing. You know, I talked about the other day, uh, this moment within that Colorado, Colorado State game with Dion. Let me say Coach Prime. I'm going to give him his respect because he's doing his thing. Uh, Coach Prime is doing something that's never been done before. And it's crazy. They even got now a little tran all transfer team uh, that they're literally rating players who have entered transfer portals and went to other schools and played and all this is because of what 
primarily Shador and Travis were doing. Uh, just mad, crazy, uh, balling. But uh, I said this in a video in the past. There's this point in the game where Jimmy Horn Jr. is not playing his best. Great athlete, played mm -hmm. lights out first couple of games, but he's dropped a couple of balls. He's feeling down. He's uh, distraught. And Dion comes out on the field, calls him over. And literally on the field, obviously there was a break in play. I don't know if it was a timeout or injury or whatever. But that's a break in the play. He's literally on the field with him, probably two yards onto the field. And he calls him over. He's got his hand on his shoulder. And I'm going to tell you about the hand on the shoulder in a minute. This is why it moves me because I see so much of what I know and understand and what can be done on a grand scale if we came together. But, 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 so he puts his hand on his shoulder. And he starts to talk to him. He's not yelling at him. Now, you got to think. Dion is, has admitted at the, after the game was over that there's a point on the sideline. He's going like, I can't let this guy beat me. After all this, I can't let this guy beat me. That press conference is going to be unbearable. So he's his reputation on the line, his pride on the line, his ego's on the line, and we know he has a big ego. It's on the line, and yet at a time when a kid who could actually get him what he needs is not performing, he doesn't yell at him. He calls him over and he speaks to him. He talks to him. And the conversation is this, hey, you got this. You're better than this. But no matter what happens, you still belong here. You're still a part of this team. We still love you. It's, you what's happening now isn't the end all be all of your world and life. And that's something we need to be telling everyone. Hey, you're having a bad day. I'm going to love you regardless. But what, 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 what I saw was that wasn't a coach. That was a father moment. That kid's father is incarcerated. And Dion speaks to him as a father. He's telling him what fathers need to tell their children. Look, I want the best for you. But in those moments where you stumble, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere because you stumble. And that's what I've been trying to tell everyone. We can't keep throwing them away. We're going to have to figure out how to be there and understand where they're at, where they're at and understand how they got there. So then here's the thing. In studying African-American adolescent and young adult male violence and discovering the need for proper racial socialization, uh, I came across the work of Dr. Howard Stevenson out of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he had also worked along and with Dr. Jar DeGruy, who most people know for post-traumatic slave syndrome, but she's in the University of Portland. And they had did some work cross-sectioned. She actually created the first mm -hmm. African-American adolescent and young adolescent respect scale because we found out the feeling of being disrespected is the number one catalyst for violence among African-American adolescents. Mm -hmm. But what Dr. Um, what Dr. Stevenson found was that in engaging with young males, at the moment that they felt disrespected, they immediately wanted to respond with violence. And he said, while there could be no uh, major influence on reducing the level of anger, by simply being touched by an elder they respected, an elder man they respected, the hand on the shoulder, it immediately reduced their desire to commit violence. It immediately reduced and calmed them. They were still upset, they were still angry, but they calmed. And there's a difference in a calm anger and a volatile anger. Well, there's, there's also a difference in a, an irrational fear and a calm awareness. And see, what Dion did is he took him from a place of fearing failure to a calm awareness of what's possible and the understanding that no matter what happens, you still belong. And see, the, one of the biggest problems in our identity crisis and the lack of racial socialization is that we aren't uh, giving these kids on any type of universal scale an awareness of who they are and the sense of belonging and a sense and an identity of what they are supposed to do. They have no sense of identity. They're searching and they're and they're squandering in their search for who they are and where they belong. And they are in a world where even adult men don't have a place. Black adults, males don't have a place. And the frustration of not being able to execute your natural masculinity in any way is frustrating. And it will lead to a disruption in an immature 
are emotionally immature, mentally immature male with physical capacity to cause harm. And so, again, we need to have more men doing that. I don't care what you think about Coach Prime. What I'm telling you is the way he's interacting with these kids is beyond coaching. This is beyond football. This isn't about me riding a wave. I call a spade a spade. I don't have to like everything a person does. I don't have to like that personality. And personally, I like the over-top confidence. I don't see over-the-top confidence as arrogance. I see it as a person saying, I'm going to be me, get used to it. We have way too many people, especially us, who have tamed who we are to make other people who don't look like us comfortable. I refuse to do it. That's why I'll walk off into a board meeting with my t-shirt and my cap on. I got the goal. And nobody wants to hear you talk about it. That's not the humility. You need humility. Do you know the damn root word for humiliate? What the root word for humility is? Humiliate. It's to bring oneself down. Now you want to tell me be humble? I get that. But see, the humbleness is not in ignoring who I am. The humbleness is an awareness of where it came from. So as long as I can acknowledge that God gifted me and prepared me and put me in the right places and that this person touched my life and that person touched my life and that I didn't just get here because I was born like this. and I'm, I'm, As long as I can acknowledge that I got here because of God and all the people he put in my life, I am humble. I don't have to walk around and sit down and act like I am not who I am. Get used to it. That's it. You can either get out of my way, go somewhere else, or you're going to get used to it. I don't sit up and I don't have to be bigger than nobody else. I don't have to act bigger than nobody else. I don't, I'm not trying to be better, better than them. I'm trying to be the best version of me, and I love it. I love who I am. I love what I've become, and I'm loving what I'm becoming. And I want to teach every black male, every young black girl the same thing. Be bold in your beauty. Be bold in your genius. Be bold in who you are. We walk around playing smart so they can feel safe. Time out for it. Time out for it. So again, to Kamala Harris, we see you. No, 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 no. We see you, and if I have anything to do about it, I'm going to put you front and center, you and your boy Joe. Also, to Coach Prime, keep doing what you're doing. Look, no matter what, keep loving on those boys. To the black collective, we need to do a better job of getting behind people who are working in the community with these boys because the government programs aren't built to work or they would have worked already. They have the funding. It's not how much money you pump in. It's the mechanisms used. If they don't work, you, can't, you can pump a billion dollars into them and you're not going to get any results. If it works, you can take one third of that, pump it into it, and you're going to get massive results. I've proven that with over and over again with the programs. It's real simple. It's real simple sociology and psychology and map, mind mapping and, 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 and paradigm creation, self-image reconstruction, all this stuff is doable. I do it for a living and I do it in the community for free. And what I can tell you is it works. The problem is we would rather sit up and wait for them to do it or we would rather sit up and just complain. Complaining is a sense and, and a, an indication of helplessness. It says, I can't fix it myself, so I'm just going to complain. I'm just going to whine. Complaining and whining is not a solution. It's not a strategy. It's not an agenda. It's just a sign of weakness. And we have resilience. We have power. We have force. We have brilliance. We have genius. And it's time to start walking in it. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Again, if you like what you hear, hit the like button. If you uh, feel it can bless someone else, please share it. If you would like to keep up with what we're doing, subscribe and follow. If you have followed me or you think you, you see something you want to get behind, click that. Uh, go into the uh, description box and choose one of the ways you can give. Uh, there's a, a 
a link there that takes you to the site that shows you so much of what we've done over the years tracks back for years the work we've done um, and you can see for yourself but whatever we're, we're saying hey it's time for us to start supporting us and start doing the things that we are capable of doing uh, I've got a, a big um, symposium coming up at the in, in uh, the beginning of Fe uh, excuse me October Again, dealing with the inner city's distrust for law enforcement. And yes, I've had to come together and get with law enforcement because they're not going anywhere. So, um, and, and all of that. So, I got that coming up and we're dealing with a study uh, from a peer that was conducted uh, by a peer and, and department chair at the University of Houston. Uh, that talks about the distrust in the community done a, a research study done in a particular community in Houston if you're familiar with Houston the Greens Point area if you're familiar with Houston all you gotta do is say Greens Point you know what I'm talking about well all of this stuff is coming ahead we're doing that this coming uh, October I'm telling you we're doing work but we need your help on that note I'm out of here thank you guys for giving me your time uh, Pay attention to what they're doing in the politics. Start really, truly investing yourself in understanding. Again, we end up where we end up because we don't understand how things work. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, look, I'm not going to be long. I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look. The easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do is to take action, to do something to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also, as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via Cash App, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, Cash App account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement we are trying to make a difference but we do need support this is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst. It's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, 
the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group. I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I want to be.